Um, so I will explain you, before we start, I will explain you, I will give you an overview of how this new system works and how much we will need your help uh, today, today um, to have a smooth and interactive webinar. So before we start, and many of you know already, um, we are the Europark Federation. My name is Barbara Page. I am the Communications and Marketing Manager of the Federation. And uh, what we do in the Europark Federation is to support the work of parks. Um, and we do this by bringing people together, exactly as we are doing today. Um, so without taking any further about the Europark Federation, and I leave it open for you if you'd like to make any questions about the work of the Federation uh, in the discussion, I would like just to introduce you um, the diff to the to the software. Okay, I see more people have joined us just now. So welcome to, to the new participants who have just joined us. I was just about to explain how our system works today. So you can see there are two viewing modes. You will find it, um, you'll find on the right upper corner of uh, the Zoom uh, room, you'll find some icons and you can change for uh, a gallery view or for um, a presenter's view. So right now you are seeing the screen of my colleague um, but once we are in the discussion, you can either see the face of all of us or just one at a time. So this is something you can decide on the right upper corner. Um, then, um, whenever you would like to make a question, uh, I would ask you to please click on the bottom of your screen where you see participants. And then there will appear a window with a full participant list. And I would like you to click on raise hand. So after you raise your hand, you leave it there and I will give you um, the floor to speak. Also important is on the bottom left, you see there is mute and stop video. So these two buttons are your controls for your audio and for your camera. So in the beginning, we will have Teresa Pastor um, and uh, making some questions to our two special guests. Um, and after that, um, I will ask you to turn on your camera if you would like to make a question. So for the time being, you can, you can keep your camera off and also please keep your microphone uh, mute. Um, and then I will tell you when is the moment, the right moment um, to turn on your uh, audio and camera. So thank you very much uh, for all of you to um, join us to, today. Um, we will look today at a very special topic. We will look at the work and the role of peri-urban parks um, for the, the contribution to European policies. And this is a special celebration of the EU Green Week. Um, the EU Green Week will be this year and will start next week um, uh, and will be um, uh, on the topic of um, green policies or EU policies. So I have asked my colleague, Teresa Pastor, to give us a brief overview of what is this about peri-urban parks and how are they contributing um, to uh, the EU policies. So Teresa, please, the floor is yours. So thank you, Barbara. Uh, I would like just to start uh, recalling that in Europe, According to Europe uh, stat data, almost 73% of the population lives in urban areas. And this is projected to increase. While we all may agree that living in urban areas has many advantages about uh, opportunities for work, for education and culture, we can also uh, understand and share that it is, it is living in, in, in an urban area can be, often be harsh. Most of the urbanization patterns in the last 50 years have produced um, large spreading cities with a uh, lot of number of, of uh, inhabitants, traffic congestions, which all cause high air pollution and noise pollution. In addition to that, uh, the urban lifestyle uh, prones to sedentarism, obesity, stress, and disconnection from nature. All these affect mental and physical uh, well being. So more than ever, policymakers and uh, urban planners and administrators of cities must rise to the following challenges. Ensure that cities provide a good quality of life for the citizens. We, Europark, we believe 
that uh, greening the city boundary, protecting pre-urban parks can uh, help to meet the challenge. And this is so because pre-urban parks already play an important role in many of the um, DG, uh, in many of the environmental policies and also as other socio, socio and um, health uh, policies and uh, to, to, to promote and to, to enhance the quality of life in cities. So today we were going to do a, a quick overview of these um, policies and the role of peri-urban parks in them. Peri-urban parks, of course, have a main role in protecting uh, EU biodiversity. Most of, the, of, the, of these type of parks uh, are, are um, classified natural 2000 sites. They also play an important role in promoting and building the green infrastructure. They, they, are, um, they constitute a next connecting green infrastructure from the wider countryside and green infrastructure inside the city. They also play a role in natural-based solution and renaturating cities. They mitigate the urban uh, heat island effect and reduce the intensity of, uh, of floods. Pre-urban parks can be considered uh, natural-based solutions in themselves. Besides uh, in, uh, reducing the urban uh, heat island effect and, uh, and avoiding floods, they also contribute to mitigate the effects of climate change by absorbing and dioxide and carbon and other greenhouse uh, gases, and also helping to reduce um, dioxide carbon emissions. They are uh, natural and legal barriers to urban development, which is one of the main problems or challenges of, 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 the, of cities today, the urban sprawl. They can have also uh, a, 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 a big role in, in, in agriculture, not only uh, about productive agriculture, but also uh, social agriculture. Rural parks uh, offer a good uh, setting scenery to active living, outdoors physical activities, outdoor sports, and to reduce the stress and mental health disorders. They also uh, usually contain, by, by their location, uh, historical uh, heritage, and, and they are pl and perfect places to host uh, cultural uh, events and, 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 to, um, and to ensure the transmission of cultural traditions uh, from uh, different generations. As I said before, they are great, uh, great uh, green scenarios to, to, to practice um, an outdoor sport and, 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 and this on a daily basis, since they are so close to cities. Uh, lastly, but not, uh, at not least, they, they have a very important role in uh, uh, educating and raising awareness about uh, environmental issues and biodiversity issues. You will find uh, more details about the role of the urban parks in EU policies in this uh, policy paper that is about to, to be uh, um, uploaded in our website. Perhaps Barbara Pace, my colleague, can uh, tell you something more about this. Okay. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, and thank you very much for the overview on the peri-urban parks. In fact, peri-urban parks are just as any normal park. The difference is that they are located so close to a city, uh, to a city uh, center that they will take huge amounts of visitors on a daily basis. So they have um, many different challenges. And of course, because they, they serve such a wide population, they, um, they, they are really, really important. What we have done today was to invite two um, protected area managers from two peri-urban parks in Portugal um, and in Italy. Actually, one of them, we are seeing it right away. The, the image you see on the back is Parco Nord Milano. And we have invited the director of the park, Nord Milano, Ricardo Gini, to uh, tell us a bit about his park and to highlight uh, his experience uh, Teresa, just if you can walk one back, 
um, and maybe just uh, turn off the, the sharing screen so we can see Fernando. Um, Fernando and Ricardo, can you please turn on your cameras? Exactly. So, Fernando, um, thank you very much for having joining us um, from the Parque Florestal de Monsanto in Portugal, in Lisbon. Um, and Fernando will tell us um, about the creation of a park um, that was created in 1934, so quite a long time ago. Um, and especially will tell us about um, how it is to be a peri-urban park in a city that has just won the 2020 European Green Capital Award. Um, before I give the voice to Fernando, um, I, I just want to introduce him. Fernando is a forester engineer um, and he's a senior advisor in the Lisbon um, Council. Um, he serves, of course, the, the Parque Florestal de Monsanto um, and he has a degree in forest engineering, but he's specialized and he has a lot of experience in landscape, uh, landscape architecture and he also master also on region and uh, urban planning. So he has a lot of experience and I'm sure that he will give us very good insights on what they are doing. Fernando, the floor is yours. Uh, Teresa, you might switch on the um, pr presentation again. Okay, so good morning. And uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about our park, which as Barbara said, uh, was created in 1934. And uh, during these 85 years, it has grown up in, uh, in a way that for the visitors, many people takes it as a natural park. So this happens because we began by introducing uh, a forest of pioneers because the soil was completely new, nude. The, it had no, nothing, nothing of a, a tree inside. And so uh, we had to plant pioneers. With these pioneers, the forest has grown up and we managed to grow a soil which allowed us to introduce uh, more exig exigent plants, especially the native trees, the forest which should be potentially natural in the place. So nowadays we have a fully developed ecosystem because we have the oak trees, which are the natural ones here, and we have of course all the bushes that naturally should be inside this kind of forest and we have also the fauna, uh, all the plants, all the, the bulbs, for example, we have lots of orchids that we've never introduced, but the, the, the response from the ecosystem uh, which was happening uh, was very good. So since 1982, we began to study the phytodynamics in order to know what was the response of the ecosystem with the introducing of the pioneers and the, with the introducing of the potentially natural forest. And the response was good, very good. We managed to have a good management plant in 1991, then a second one in 2000 and so on. But nowadays we have uh, around 70 direct workers, 100 indirect workers and 250 other indirect workers that work for the park itself, but through some of the utilities that we have inside the park. And we have around uh, 400 daily users and around 2 million daily passive users, which are the people who just pass in the park and the people who live in the city and who take the advantage of having a, such a park in the surroundings. So in some events, we have even some thousands of people inside the park, which are, of course, sometimes a problem. But especially we dedicate ourselves to environmental education activities, sporting activities, and uh, we try to improve a lot the biodiversity. Because this park, it works and it is very important to the city, even for those who are not there. Even the, for just the people who live in the city, they take the advantages of having such a park inside the city. It's important so for, to know that uh, the park is 1,000 hectares. 
and the city is around 8,800. So it's about one tenth of the city is the area of the park. So, Fernando, uh, can you tell us more about this biodiversity that uh, you have mentioned that uh, is in your park and how it relates to the biodiversity strategy from Lisbon? Okay, so we have a, a strategy for 2020 around, about the biodiversity in the city. And of course, the park is an important issue in this biodiversity strategy because, as you know, most of the animals have needs of area, territory. And so if they have these needs, they need to have some, some kind of animals need to have large areas. In the city, it's difficult to have this. So if you plan a green infrastructure in the city, and if you have a park like the park, Monsanto Park, which is big enough to host the nesting of these animals, afterwards they can go to the city, to inside the city and to the small gardens and the small parks which are in the city. So the strategy is to improve as much as possible the biodiversity in the park in order afterwards to, through green corridors, to take this biodiversity into the city. So we wish to have a living city. This is a picture of the Monsanto Park in the city. And if you just look uh, the park, which formerly was a peri-urban park, nowadays was embedded by the growing, growing of the city. So both Lisbon and the neighborhoods which are around the city, they really embed the park. So what we are working now is on working on this kind of corridors in order to improve both the migration routes of the fauna, but also to improve the pedestrian routes. If the people can go walking or cycling or uh, running to the city, probably the fauna will go also. So we, what we are trying is to improve these kind of green corridors, both to inside the city, and these are the inside the city corridors, but also to the other city councils. There are some regional structures which we are working with in order to improve this kind of connections. This, for example, is a peripheral uh, corridor in the city. And uh, these are some of the parts, some of, of the gardens which are connected with the Monsanto Park. Mm -hmm. And we, we try to improve both the connections and both to avoid the fragmentation effect of the buildings. For example, by lowering the buildings. If you have the need to, buy, to, to build a new building in, in this kind of corridors, we try to get them as low as possible in order to have, for example, the birding fauna uh, to, to pass over the buildings. So uh, we have different strategies um, connected with the different situations. And this is really important. This is a, a main corridor which connects the Monsanto Park to the center of the city. So it, this is uh, the, 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 the biggest. And as you see, it is not always connected by forest trees. Sometimes it is by orchards, uh, wild pastures, fruit trees, even uh, a farm where we try to show how to produce crops. Um, not industrial agriculture, but um, in order for people to see how to, to, to raise uh, most of the, um, the, the, the food we, we need to have in the city, uh, just an ex example, because the city is so small. And so most of the food, of course, comes from out of the boundaries of the city. But uh, the, they are really important. For example, in the, the upper part of this slide, you can see a, a corridor, which is the corridor of Alcantara Valley, which will connect also the park to the river. Uh, the environment of the city is very good in order because it, we have two main uh, pools of uh, wilderness in the city. The main is the River Tagus, and the second one is the park of Monsanto, because the River Tagus works as a buffer for example, for the Eat Island, and which is very well complemented by the Monsanto Park. 
Um, yes, we won the award of uh, European Dream Capital, and um, we yeah. we expect <laughs> this um, this award uh, at least to call up uh, people's attention to the environment in the city. Uh, of course, this is a, uh, an award of, of, of the work we've been doing. And probably um, it has been um, evaluated that our work is really well done. Uh, we have, for example, some certifications of uh, sustainable forest management. These are very important for us. And, um, and this award is also a, a way to show that um, that the city is working well, and uh, probably most of the people, if they are not yet aware about the importance of the green infrastructure in the city, probably from now on they are going to. So um, we are going to have uh, lots of activities, especially to show everybody what what is the work we've been doing and how it is good for them to take advantage of it. Of course, we are working for biodiversity. We say we are working for biodiversity. We have a local action plan for biodiversity in Lisbon 2020, which is already eight years old, and we are working for eight years uh, to 2020. And, um, and of course, we, we are not just caring about biodiversity uh, for itself, we are we are working because if we have biodiversity in the city, that means that the urban environment is in a good quality, and a city with a good quality is a, a city where it, it is worthwhile to live in. So we are working for people, and uh, we are bringing biodiversity for the city inside the city because it's where the people are, and we want. Many people live in the cities and they have never been in touch with a pristine ecosystem. And sometimes they take the Monsanto Park as a, a, a pristine ecosystem. Thank you very much, Fernando. Um, for those who don't want, uh, who don't know, um, last year the European Commission um, awarded or recognized Lisbon as the 2020 European Green Capital. And when I first asked Fernando, um, when how did it change the work of the park fernando fernando gave me a very interesting question so i asked him um what after after lisbon has received the 350000 euros um as a financial incentive to to work better um on the on their uh, green uh, plan um fernando told me something very interesting fernando can you tell to our participants what we think is that we are not going to change, change too much. This is really an award for our work. So we, what we wish is to have more resources to continue the work we've been doing, because as it, sh it is shown, it seems to be a, 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 a well done work. Thank you very much, Fernando. Mm -hmm. um, so, Teresa, I will ask you to please turn off the um, presentation again. And I would like to open to our participants, to anyone who would like to make any question to Fernando or to comment. Fernando told us about the green infrastructure and the macro planning of the city. And it's really, really interesting how they are trying to connect a city that is made of cement, actually unfortunately, but with new and new green spaces coming. Um, so I would like to give you participants the opportunity, if any of you would like to make a question, make a comment, um, please raise your hand or turn on your camera directly. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, Fernando, there are still a lot of uh, foresting actions going on in the park. How, how are you working with it? Do you involve volunteers? How is it working? Yes, we work volunteers, we work volu just uh, families or groups or enterprises, for example, in um, team building actions. Uh, the work we, we are doing now is a work on detail. So if you look at the past, look at the history of the past, 
we had the pioneers, then we have the native, native trees, and now we are working on the detail, on the very correct scope in order to build small landscapes. When you are traveling through the park, you, you, you are uh, guided like if you were in a film, in a movie. So we, you, you are going to see Belvedere's, we are, you are going to have some Belvedere's which are not looking for out of the park, but for inside the park. And you are, you are have, going to have a certain amount of bushes and the organization of these bushes, which look like natural, but with which, of course, have our help. We have been working as catalysator of a, 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 nat a natural process, a succession to uh, directed to the climax. So we are improving, for example, the nesting opportunities of birds. We are working on the spreading of bushes which give more food, both to insects and to the fauna which are crucivorous. So we are working on detail now. And this is something which is, of course, we, we need to work on the maintenance. We need to work on the prevention of forest fires. We need to work on lots of things. But of course, I think nowadays, if you travel on the park, you are going to see that we are working on the detail. And this is very funny because some people just go there. They just build the detail. For example, a small pond or to put a boxing nest, a box, uh, nesting box. Um, some things like this, which look like less important but which really contribute to the improvement of biodiversity and to the renaturalization of the farm. Thank you, Fernando. I You're see welcome. we have a question from Manas. Manas. Um, maybe you can, I haven't muted you. Maybe you can uh, turn on your camera as well so we can see who is the person making the question. Exactly, perfect. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, well, first of all, thank you a lot for for this uh, conference speech uh, meeting uh, for organizing this. I think it's it's pretty nice. Thanks to you, Barbara, Fernando, and Teresa for your input. Um, should I shortly introduce myself, or yeah, should you I? can you can? Yeah. Well, um, my name is Alvaro Mañas. I'm from Spain, but I actually work in Germany in a certification company for food products like agricultural. And um, yeah, I had a question because um, something that called my attention was a comment that Teresa made that the parks may enhance the agriculture. Mm -hmm. This is this is for me something a bit tricky because I don't see that agriculture as activity or as a sector can be included in, in park management as such as leisure activity. Okay. Oh yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's depending of course of the typology of the parks. So we have uh, agricultural parks that are devoted to uh, productive agriculture. And in usually these parks which are located close to cities, they tend to do um, agro-environmental friendly agriculture. And of course it's a kilometer zero agriculture, but also other type of parks like forest parks, they, in order to increase biodiversity, um, they also use agriculture for that, opening spaces and creating new habitats. And it, it, uh, recovering um, past uh, habitats that used to, to, to exist already around cities. Usually around cities, um, people were growing food. So it's a really a management activity that is, is currently doing in, in some parks. For example, in Park of Cocerola, here in Barcelona, where I'm based, uh, they, have, they, they, they have a very intensive uh, program to, to, to increase biodiversity by, use, by reintroducing uh, or um, re reinforcing agriculture. Also because it helps to, uh, for, fire, for fire prevention. Uh -huh. so it really is a man well, management. I like to add something. Yeah. Can I? Yes, yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, Fernando. The, the question, we are not introducing uh, industrial farming. Ah. We are introducing family agriculture. And so these are small areas. Uh, we have some corridors which are established through 
or, uh, orchards of 80 square meters per family. Mm -hmm. okay. And these are small areas, but they are very diverse. Mm -hmm. And in terms of biodiversity, if you think about an ecosystem, if it has the introduction of the human uh, wishes, it improves the biodiversity by generating different niches. Mm -hmm. So you could generate different habitats and you can improve the fauna through it. Mm -hmm. You just need to establish good guidelines so that this family uh, agriculture, they don't use pesticides. They made as, as much as possible biological agri agriculture and so on. So with this kind of agriculture, it's really for sure a way to improve biodiversity because the biodiversity we have in the forest and the biodiversity we have in the Horsha and the biodiversity we have in the border between the Horsha and the, the forest, they are really heading themselves. So you don't have A, you don't have B, you have A plus B plus C. And this is really a high figure in terms of biodiversity. So, so in, inside the city, small areas with agricu uh, family agriculture are socially important and are biologically important in terms of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in, a, in a lot of cases, uh, agriculture also plays a, an important social role. So it's an environmental education, it's activity for the families, it's to promote healthier ways of eating. Um, and our next in guest will also um, give us a, a little hint of what he is doing in his park in North Milano. But before I um, invite Ricardo to turn on his camera, which you can do already, Ricardo, I would just like to ask if any of you would like to share a question. Uh, or a comment. I see Nuno has his camera on. Maybe he wants to share something. No one. Okay, so we have Thai people today. Okay, so let's do the following. I will. Oh, there is Bridget. Bridget, you can you can turn on your camera and also um, make your question. Okay, I don't have access to webcam, so I'll just no ask problem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that the health and well-being benefits of uh, the Mon Monsanto Park were part of the, making the case to um, to make such a great park area. Are you doing any studies um, to evidence the health and well-being? Um, and, uh, and within that, are you trying? to place a monetary value on those health and well-being benefits. Thank you. Well, we don't have uh, a special work done on the connection, on the relation between the existence of the park and the city uh, well-being or health. Uh, but we have international studies and we have also uh, one uh, institution, one university, which is developing lots of studies about um, the well-being and the connections with the well-being and the environmental issues, not strictly with the park. So we are having lots of studies, but mostly they are now, now directed to more uh, ecological issues like, for example, the monitoring of the biodiversity, uh, the improvement of uh, environmental education activities in the city and in the park, and so on. So uh, we not, are not investing a lot nowadays, um, but of course it's an uh, open field that we can uh, explore and improve. That's absolutely fine, thank you. Um, yes, and uh, let me give an invitation as Bridget spoke about health. Um, our next Europark conference in Latvia will focus a lot on the health issues. Um, and this is an open invitation to all of you. Registrations will open next week. Um, and the main topic will be um, how can parks play a better and more important role to our health. 
Um, so you are all invited to go. It's in Latvia in the last week of September. But meanwhile, we have a question from Ricardo and a question from Nuno, both from Portugal, I believe. So Ricardo, maybe I'll give you the, I will give you the voice. Thank you. Are you listening to me? Yes. Okay. The question is directly to Fernando. I cross Monsanto narrowly every day from my uh, everyday uh, traveling uh, from home to, to work. And uh, I was um, surprised by the numbers of users and visitors that Fernando has, has points for Monsanto Forest Park. Have you done any uh, work like it has been done in Pochorola? I'm sure that Teresa Pastor can tell a little bit about the work that uh, Stella Farias has been doing. Mm. <laughs> Have you done any work like that uh, to, to, to estimate that number of visitors? Uh, because it's something that we are interested in on it in, in my uh, research group. And I'm working with Stella nowadays on my PhD, so it might be some uh, nice uh, uh, place to, to, to put some of our practice in, 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 in fields. Uh, so that, that's the question. How, how did you estimate all those 2 million users and 15,000 uh, visitors per day? Yes, we estimated in uh, different ways. For example, we have daily counting in some playgrounds like Serafina mm -hmm. and uh, in Alvito. So we have daily countings. And we have also uh, a connection with all the infrastructures which are inside the park in order to know how many daily users they have. For example, how many people are playing tennis in the Lisbon Tennis Center, how many people are um, playing rugby in the, 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 the rugby facilities, how many people are playing football in the football facilities, how many people are making cycling in Monsanto Park every day. So with the heading of this structure, of these figures, we have the whole number. So the whole number is a, a built number and it uses different ways of counting. Some are very accurate. We can tell you that, for example, in the weekend of May, we already had 5,000 people inside a playground, which was awful because we needed to establish control of entrances because it is free entrance and so everybody goes there. So we need to establish some stops, some barriers, some uh, carrying capacity, capacity numbers, and with this, uh, stopping this. Um, Fernando, hope... let me ask you just, do you have any counters in place? Yes. OK. OK. Um, so, Nuno, please. Yes. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the webinar. Um, I'm from Portugal, and I'm a biologist. And I'm very interested in the urban ecology uh, both the in the um, And then being in Portugal, I noticed, well, I, I think the work being done in Lisbon is being very good and, and very important. And uh, to be honest, I was only completely aware of it uh, after it won the, the, the European um, Green Capital Award. Uh, um, and, and my remark is, is exactly about communication. Um, most of the, of the Portuguese cities, even small ones, are not aware of the importance of having a good green infrastructure in them, or even having a, a proper city park. So I think one, one very good outcome of, of being the European Green Capital would be to, to have this outreach to the country, and especially to smaller municipalities, and showing them how important it is to, to have a proper green infrastructure. Because this, today, Parks are still planned in the way they were planned in the 80s and in the 90s, and, and this needs to be changed. And this, and I think it's easier if it's changed uh, by somebody who already has um, manages a city and, and telling that to other cities than the biologist, as myself and others, telling decision makers, well, you should do a different way. So uh, this is a sort of a of a um, of a request and also a question: Do you have this communication um, plan thought of? for the European Green Capital? Yes, we have. We have the, the intention. But of course, as you know, 
uh, one thing is what we wish mm -hmm. the other thing is the information and the communication between technicians from different city councils mm -hmm. and the other thing is the politician issue and this of course i cannot speak about and i think that of course i think that my our city council has done a lot in terms of these but of course i think there are there is always something else that should be done and that could be done so uh, what we are really going to reach, I cannot tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Uh, wait, uh, 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 I'm not able to guess the future. But uh, in spite of this, I think uh, we are doing a lot. We have connections with the regional structures, the metropolitan area of Lisbon, and not only. And uh, we are in touch, for example, with the ICNF, which is an institution of conservation of nature and forests. And um, I think we are, we are trying to uh, the effects, the positiveness of this uh, work. I'm, I cannot assure you. Okay, thank you very much for all the questions. Thank you, Nuno. Thank you, Ricardo. And thank you, Fernando. Um, for, so now, for now, uh, we have heard a lot about biodiversity and green infrastructure. So we invited um, the director of uh, Parco Nord Milano, Ricardo Gini. Maybe, Ricardo, you can turn on your camera so people can see you. Um, and Ricardo will tell us something more on other areas. So he will tell us more about how is a park uh, working on the social aspects. Ricardo. Ricardo, dove è Ricardo? You have to... Sì, sì, okay. connetta la tua camera. I, I try, but uh, I try, but you, you, you see that you cannot start the video because the host has disabled it. Ah. He has disabled me. Okay, so just start your presentation, I will fix it. Okay. This is uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is the, the place in the Park Nord uh, in the city, the, the metropolitan city of Milan. And uh, you see that is uh, in the northern part of uh, the northern park of Milan. And uh, the, 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 the feature of the park is that the, the park is a totally built. Is, uh, Okay, okay, it's, it, it works. Okay, uh, welcome. <laughs> and the history of the park is uh, uh, the, um, an history that starts in, in 1983 when uh, in the abandoned area, the ex industrial areas, uh, we try to, uh, to, to plant uh, some trees. That is the, the, the situation in the 60s and this is the situation uh, now. Uh, and uh, we, we started planting the, the first plant in 1983, and the process is a, is a, a longer process, and we keep doing it because uh, this is my garden that uh, planted uh, yesterday or the day before uh, the 20, the 36 plot of uh, of woods. Then. Uh, this process uh, we 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 can't stop to to plant it because uh, um, we try to uh, to change the the way of the ex this uh, industrial era by um, by trees and uh, also the the people uh, increasing uh, day by day year by year and then this is the picture for the, the last uh, 19 and then uh, we, we, we estimated uh, to more than uh, two million people. Uh, in also, we are uh, some eco counters that uh, counted exactly the people that start that uh, come into the park, and uh, we are like uh, Monsanto, different way to estimate uh, how many people uh, stay in uh, in the park every week, but also every day. The main goal of the park is build nature and biodiversity, but now the, the second step is 
spread environmental culture and deliver ecosystem services. Different kind of deliver the ecosystem mm -hmm. services, but uh, we we try to to change the the perception of the citizens. The park is not only an environmental fact, but also a cultural fact. And then it's very important for the citizens. Yeah, in fact, uh, Peru Ramparts, as we have uh, uh, explained before, can have a big role in provisioning services, not only in terms of uh, farming, but also if it's, it's a Peru Ram forest in terms of diet timber and biomass production, or even mushrooms. Uh, if it's a, it's a alluvial play in terms of the drinking water for, for, for the cities. So uh, we also talk about more not productive agriculture, but social uh, agriculture. Uh, yeah. uh, what, what, um, what can you tell us uh, about this uh, project that you have in your park? Yes, uh, uh, this, uh, this slide uh, talk about uh, Orto Comune di Guardo. That uh, is a project that uh, was born uh, three years ago when we realized that uh, in addition to the model of the, the, the traditional family garden that uh, uh, involves uh, uh, more the, the 450 parcel and more and over uh, 600 families, uh, we could propose to the citizens to cultivate uh, um, 5,000 uh, square meters of land all together without fences, cooperating with uh, each other, each other, and building a huge vegetable garden, a place of meeting and social cohesion. The operation is uh, very simple. You can associate uh, to the, the, the Orto Comune with uh, a, an annual uh, fee of uh, 10 euros, uh, and uh, to you cooperate to to product the the the, the, the garden, and the, the level. I, I underline this, this fact, the level of social cohesion and uh, cooperation is uh, so, high, so high that uh, uh, not only there are no conflicts, but uh, they produce so many vegetables uh, that uh, the 160 uh, members of the Orto Community Guard come to our event and uh, exchange for donation, they give the, the fruits of the world. That is a very a uh, very in interesting uh, experiment uh, and uh, a very uh, symbol of the capacity of the citizens to uh, to work uh, together and to uh, transform the, the 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 take care for the for the land in a, a very urban fashion. Okay, another type of cultural uh, services that uh, Peruvian parks deliver is what they, the so-called cultural services, which include recreation, sports, education, cultural events. Yeah. And, and this type of cultural uh, services are very uh, relevant for Peruvian parks because of their location. So because of the number of people uh, they receive, even on a, on, on a very high frequent basis, even on a daily basis. And... Uh, that's why also pre Rampas have an important role also as, as um, dis in disseminating, disseminating the biodiversity values. And, yes. and we would like to know which kind of educational, environmental uh, programs do you have or do you put in place in, in Peru Urbano, uh, in, 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 in Parco Nor Milano in this regard? Yes, yes. Um, yes, every year we offer schools uh, different educational programs. Uh, ranging from uh, uh, kindergarten to the high school. We, we, uh, to each of the categories of students, uh, we offer customized programs, uh, ranging from the simple discovery of nature for the little ones, uh, always uh, with the great attention to experimental path, uh, experiential path, uh, to real scientific laboratory analysis activities for the, the, the older ones, for the, the, the students that are, are able to understand uh, this uh, scientific uh, laboratory. Um, and uh, in, we have also a specific multimedia center that we call Oxygen, in partnership with uh, a pharmaceutical company uh, that uh, deals specifically the teams of the breath combining the breath of the man with the breath, the, the breath of the planet. 
We have also, after the school, uh, in the, the summertime, many campus with uh, many families that uh, uh, work uh, we, we, with us. And uh, in this uh, Aula Verde, the Greek classroom, you see uh, we have uh, 70 working days during the summer to uh, live in, in the park to, to uh, involve the, the children in the, in the, in the, the life of the park. Okay. That, yes. Yeah. Do you have a specific, a specific uh, biodiversity event to promote yes. uh, biodiversity among the whole population? Uh, you see in this slide uh, that the Festival of Biodiversity every year in September, the park proposed the Biodiversity Festival, that is the, the 13th edition uh, this year. Two weeks of events, music show, cinema and theaters, laboratories, exhibition, direct experience that decline the theme of biodiversity according to the different aspects that bring the citizens and family closer to this complex uh, concept that risks to remain abstract. The idea is to propose to all the category of the people that who frequent the park, the experience to uh, how crucial the diversity and origin of living species is also, also in everyday life. Performers, actors, musicians, scientists, environmental education, educators, propose initiative every year that we selected with our scientific board, our scientific committee, uh, to react and to involve more than 30,000 uh, people uh, in uh, two weeks uh, of celebration and awareness, awareness of the importance of uh, biodiversity. And, and how do you engage with young people? And the, in, in addition to the, 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 the educational program by school, uh, for uh, over 10 years at the park, we offer to the young people uh, up to 29 years uh, of doing a year of civil uh, services in which they work uh, in the park for part time daily uh, for a fee uh, uh, 40, 45, 405 euros for month, per month. And uh, this experience allows him to be protagonist of many of our, of our initiatives uh, to learn how to work in a public institution. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, over 70 people who passed, who have passed uh, from uh, this experience uh, has allowed us to find a stable job for them. Then it's important because uh, you know that the, the problem of the work is, uh, is uh, of the job is uh, a big problem. And uh, I saw that uh, these uh, young people that stay one hour here in our in our organization uh, will be able to uh, are be able to uh, to insert in the in the work uh, world. Mm -hmm very with competence. Now I have uh, 13 young people who are doing service uh, from us and uh, uh, from two years ago uh, the Donner Park has become the referent for the civil services for all the young people who want, who want to have uh, this experience in the parks of Lombardy. I would. Uh, one, one important aspect also, Ricardo, that uh, I know you are working with is on the integration of uh, refugees. Can you elaborate a bit about this? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, you know that the phenomenon of migration has been very strong in Italy in, in recent years and then the park uh, could ignore, couldn't uh, ignore it. Uh, in uh, the last six years, uh, we have created two parallel programs uh, for who are still waiting for a resident permit, we propose to help us in the park maintenance on a voluntary basis by doing a small job by, to clean or maintain uh, the benches, for example. And uh, for those who obtain the, res the resident permit, we develop uh, specific courses for gardeners 
that were followed by work grants for that uh, for an innovation um, included uh, the young people of both in the park structure and my my structure uh, both in the cooperatives companies that are uh, working uh, with us in this in that way we show to the population that uh, the migrants are, are a resource and not a board and that uh, is uh, very important to to explain how how is uh, the the resources how the migrants can, could be a, a resource and not only a problem. Exactly, and simultaneously, you are also giving them a space in the in the community in the society. You are giving them the possibility to learn Italian, to connect with different people. Yes. Um, so I believe it's a really valuable experience. And I know that many other parks in Europe are also working with refugees. Um, so maybe um, Ricardo, thank you for um, for sharing your your projects. Um, I would I would ask Teresa again to put us in the in the viewer mode, so we can all um, ask questions to Ricardo. But we haven't finished. No. Okay. So you can there, because Peru Rampart <laughs> play a lot of more uh, services, not only for visitors, but also as passive, passive um, people, as uh, Fernando said. One of these type of, um, of services that Peru Parks do is to uh, what the so-called regulating services, uh, regulating uh, temperature, um, and air, uh, uh, quality of air, quality of water, so, uh, Fern uh, Ricardo, can you tell us exactly what your park do, for example, uh, to combat the human heat island effect? Yes, yes, thank you, Teresa, for the question. Uh, park Honor has built uh, over 10, uh, uh, 100 uh, hectares, 101 hectares of woods to fight uh, the urban heat island. But now, uh, he, he tried to, uh, today it continues to be to, to forest it not only within our borders but also outside and uh, in fact the technical structure of the park has been um, called uh, to collaborate with the municipality of Milan and the metropolitan city to implement a program that uh, had the goal to plant 3 million trees uh, by uh, 2030. It's a, a very ambitious program uh, it is, is uh, lying uh, with the international program. You, I think, you know the 100 resilient city, which uh, is uh, is a goal. Is not uh, an attainable attainable goal if uh, combined the construction of the, the the large park of metropolitan park, uh, and um, we try to link it and coordinate the, the the many existing areas you see. In the first slide, uh, there are many uh, green areas in the Metropolitan Park, and then uh, we try to to to, to spread the, the forest in the in the also in the in some agricultural area to um, to to fight uh, the urban heat island. And lastly, supporting services, which is the the base of the services, which uh, uh, can uh, allow for the other uh, uh, ecosystem services to exist, is what they call supporting services, that's habitats, ecosystems, and biodiversity itself. So your park has been started from scratch, so it didn't exist before. How, how, how do you create new habitats? How do you create uh, ecosystems? Uh, yeah. In addition to, yes. to plant trees, how do you promote uh, biodiversity? Yes, we also uh, in uh, we planted forest. I, I said, but uh, for example, in this situation in the Stavros River, that uh, is uh, like a rubbish dump uh, when I came uh, to to the park on Nord, and uh, we clean this this area. We transform uh, this uh, the rubbish dump in uh, in the in some in different situation. If you show the the, the next slide. Uh, they can see how is the, the, the result of our work. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, we, we, we created many lakes. Uh, and uh, now I, I can count uh, 20 species of mammals, 25 species of dragon balls, uh, or 85 species of uh, birds that are nesting also in, uh, 
in, uh, in the park, uh, some species of reptiles. Then uh, when you create uh, the ecosystem, uh, the nature come uh, uh, without uh, many effort. It's important to, to manage the, um, the, the different way to leave the park. Uh, we are different areas, some areas where the people can frequent the, 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 the park and many others that uh, uh, remain more, uh, and more quiet than the nature can, uh, can stay well. One important thing in the park, there is no light. There is no, uh, is there, is there no, uh, when, when the as artificial light, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. that's very important to for the fauna mm -hmm. for the, for to to increase the biodiversity. For the citizens, it's quite a problem, but uh, they are educated to understand this uh, this uh, feature of the park. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, thank, thank you. So uh, Ricardo has told us about provisioning services and how they are working with agriculture. He spoke about the cultural um, activities and the environmental awareness education um, activities they are organizing. But he also told us important projects with young people and um, migrants. And of course, the services, the regulating and supporting services and how the park is working uh, to enhance those. So. I will open it now for you. Um, I will ask you to please share your camera and share your thoughts. Um, if you would like to make a question, you can raise your hand or just turn on your camera automatically. So let's make this final 10 minutes of our meeting today much more interactive. Um, Fernando, you can also turn on your camera, please. Um, and maybe participants have comments to add, maybe you would like to share um, an example from your park, how are you working with volunteers, for example, or how is your park providing services? Is there anyone who would like to intervene? Hmm. Maybe Bridget, Bridget. Please. Yes, okay. Oops, Thank you very much for your question. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't introduce myself last time. I'm Bridget Finton. I work for Scottish Natural Heritage. Uh, and in Scotland, we are making progress um, in trying to work much more closely, the environment sector, to work much more closely with the health sector. Um, and we are promoting use of the outdoors um, to support health policies and, um, and priorities um, and use the outdoors as, as we say, as our natural health service. And we're really encouraging the environment sector to play their part and reach out to the health sector and, and particularly um, local um, local health professionals and I'm wondering um, Ricardo whether there is um, any more opportunity uh, in Milan to work in partnership with health practitioners um, uh, we are trying to um, encourage them to, to target people with with chronic in particular chronic um, health conditions uh, could be physical um, health issues, for example, diabetes, cancer, um, uh, osteoporosis. We know that physical inactivity is such a such a, uh, <coughs> a pressing issue, but um, <clears throat> we also know that being close to nature can help people with mental health issues. So I'm wondering whether you feel that there are opportunities to um, work cl work with the health sector and and perhaps also link with voluntary sector organizations who can support people with health issues to you use the park to obtain health benefits 
Yes, uh, um, in in the territory of the park, we have one hospital, one specific hospital, and then uh, we work uh, with the, the this uh, structure to uh, to manage to, uh, to 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 do the some specific program with the different kind of uh, of of people are uh, problem with the, his health. Um, we we have uh, uh, many many uh, structures that come uh, to the park to um, to do uh, the specific exercise, for example, to to, to stay well, uh, and we go to uh, uh, a pediatric for, for with children to animate uh, uh, some um, programs inside the, 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 the hospital. But uh, it's quite difficult to um, to quantify the and to, to, to quantify how is the, the value of this work. Uh, one of uh, important ecosystem services is uh, uh, well-being, but uh, it's not easy to uh, to, to, tra to transform uh, these uh, activities uh, in in money, in a quantity of money. And that is important because uh, uh, when uh, uh, we we try to uh, to explain how is important one park, we, we we are not able to quantify in money how is the the, the real value for uh, for the society to have the place like Parco Nord, like Parco de Monsanto, uh, to where, where the, the citizens uh, could be better, not, not only the, the, the citizens that are in a good condition, in good health condition, also for the people that is not uh, in, uh, in very good condition. I could add that uh, in our park, uh, we work as a facilitator. We are a spot where the people can have health activities, physical activities, and so on. So um, these these kind of um, spot can be by everybody. Of course, if somebody comes uh, to our office and asks us for cooperation, generally we give all the cooperation we have. But in terms of counting, in terms of having uh, figures about the, 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 the effectiveness of the relationship between the health conditions and the nat natural activity. So it's, um, it's, um, it's not yet that, that much studied, but I think it's really effective. I think most of the people have the, the idea that it is really effective. And we are talking a lot, for example, about the, the improving of the effectiveness of the work when you are in an environment of quality. So what we try to, to do is to improve the environmental quality. And with this quality, we hope that the people who live in Lisbon, who uses Lisbon as a a, a place to visit or to, to, to work in, uh, that they have a good quality environment. Thank you very much, Fernando. Um, and thank you very much, Ricardo, for your answers. And let me just add something um, uh, on, the, on the intervention from Bridget. Uh, Bridget is actually um, a member of Europark um, Health Commission, and they have produced um, last year a, a toolkit on health. I will share my screen with you so you can see. Uh, and in this toolkit, um, we have a lot of examples. So this is a toolkit. We have a lot of examples um, and guidelines on how parks can work better on the health uh, agenda. So there is um, a lot of material that you, can, that you can get inspiration from, and it's all available online. It's very easy to find it. You just need to open our website go to Knowledge Hub here, and in the Knowledge Hub, you have a list of um, the main topics uh, that we are working with and topics that are relevant for the work of protected areas, and you'll find in Health and Green Exercise this toolkit.
Okay, it's just um, a tool that um, we produce to all parks, um, so you are free to use it. But meanwhile, we have Stella Farias. Uh, Stella, please introduce yourself and um, and tell us your question. And if you can turn on your camera, Stella. Okay, maybe we cannot hear you. There is might be some problem with your audio. Um, meanwhile, um, is there any other question or any other comment you would like to do? Any of the other participants who are silent? Don't be shy. We have created this interactive um, webinar so that we can all connect and share experience. So even if it's not a question, but it's something that you would like to share with us on how your park is working, you still have five minutes to go. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to, to ask a question to Fernando then. Um, Fernando, a lot of your work, it's about managing overflows of visitors. And uh, I know you are using a lot of trail design to, to do it. Can you just give us some, some tips? Oh, we have Maria Marti also. Okay. Okay, just to have a, a, qu a quick answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I could say that... Um, Maria? Yeah, yeah, please, Fernando, go on, go on. In order to, to have um, the improvement of good users and to lower the bad users, we are trying to, to concentrate the impact of the people walking in the park, in the trails. So we benefited at the trails, we enriched the trails with more information and with more things in order for the, for the people who are visiting the park to make more interpretation trails, uh, to take advantage of the biodiversity by learning how to, to see when you look at, and especially uh, when you allowing people to understand the presence of fauna even when they don't see it. So this uh, approach is really important and we are trying to design these kind of trails and um, these trails we are working them as I told as a, if it is a movie when you are walking the, these trails and uh, we are working a lot on details. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando. Maria. And Maria. Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, my question is, uh, I want to know how is the engagement of the municipalities with your project in Milan or Lisbon? Because in, in my case, <coughs> Conchonola Park, we have nine municipalities taking part of the consortium, but in fact, only two are absolutely engage and I think the other the other seven they consider that our park is important but it's an accessory uh, target and, and it's not in the in the top of the list uh, this is uh, I don't I don't give you the names because I don't want to to have my my cot killed and, but uh, I would like to know uh, if, uh, if the, really you are strategical projects for the for the city or for the quality of the city or so on yeah. this is my question okay uh, uh, uh. I, I can answer just uh, with a small answer I, I, I would say that um, we have the support the park is supported by the the, the political uh, structure and they really know and understand the, the importance of the park. And if you are asking me whether we, we, we would like to have more resources, of course we do. Uh, but I think we are never satisfied what, with what we really have because we wish always to do more and more and more. Well, but we, I, we are never satisfied, of course. But do you, you uh, consider that is in the top of the list is a strategic considered by the politicians or yeah i can i can speak from top. milan <laughs> <laughs> i can speak from the situation of milan and then i have to, to say that uh, 
the city of Milan is very interested in the forest program, and uh, I think is uh, in, the, in the top of the list. Now, this, uh, this, uh, our major, Mr. Sala, is very, is very interested in the forest program, and then uh, uh, he, he bought, the, the, the municipality bought a plan in which Milan, before 2030, uh, have more than three million trees is uh, in in mm -hmm. our. We have uh, uh, some uh, uh, financial uh, mean, mean to 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 do it, and um, we work uh, very hard with the Polytechnic or with the other uh, institution of Milan to 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 realize uh, this uh, ambitious uh, program. I am very happy because uh, uh, for the climate change is. Uh, uh, something that the, the municipality, uh, the municipality understand how is the, uh, the the problem of the climate change and react with the use in in uh, one way also for uh, the forest problem. Mm -hmm. Then the periurban park uh, become very important to uh, to realize and to foster this uh, this uh, this policy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Maria. We are on our time, but I see that someone else has a question. Manas? Yeah, it's, it's me again. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Alvaro, si. So, so my question is, it's also a bit in, in the line of um, what it was just questioned. Um, the parks for the peri-urban areas, there's always the... I wouldn't say the threat, but uh, quite often is this um, is this issue with expansion of the of the big cities. This is maybe uh, yeah in countries like like Spain and and Italy probably big cities maybe Barcelona. I'm from Madrid. Um, there's always this issue, right? That, um, more people are coming in in cities. They are moving there and. The parks might have this demographical pressure, and I would like to know if you also face those issues in Lisbon, in Milan, and uh, yeah, the examples that you mentioned. Um, maybe, maybe instead of Fernando and Ricardo, I will ask Maria, who is also here yeah. with us, and Maria <laughs> is the director of the Colcerola Park in Barcelona, which is really um, important role in uh, stopping or halting um, uh, the city development. Maria. Yes, well, in fact, uh, when a park, when a territory is protected, it is protected, uh, real protected. But nevertheless, we have some little invasions and we have to fight to take out this, this, uh, new, this new commerce. This is a demographic uh, pressure. We are under pressure and it's, it's, a, it's a different uh, management type of management compared with a natural park uh, far away from the cities. But um, the protection, it, 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 it works because uh, we have a, a border uh, well, well delimited, well marked, and it is, it is, it, there is no, no question to, to, to build up new buildings or so on. Uh, but the, the problem is the, 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 the open spaces that are not specially protected. They, they, they are encroached and we have, we have the, the, with a metropolitan vision, we have to fight to stop the, this encroachment, this uh, occupation. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, with the pro with a with a park, a protected park, when we we have uh, some tools, we have uh, uh, managing uh, organisms, We can fight. Uh, we can keep uh, the, the protection. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I imagine it's the same or in in Milan and in in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. And the expansion is never. An option, no. I mean, it's. I guess in Barcelona, especially, it's it's very difficult to consider something such a such an expansion of the Corsarola Park. Well, an expansion of Corsarola, no, because it's like uh, Parco Nord Milano is a green isle. We are surrounded by cities, by uh, motorways, by uh, neighborhoods. Uh, yeah. The 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 the. the 
one of the problem of urban parks is the, the isolation, the fragmentation and uh, uh, the lack of green corridors. But well, we, we try to set up like uh, Fernando Louro and Ricardo Gia has explained, uh, and it's not it. we, we have to use uh, our cars, uh, uh, <laughs> avenues or some uh, gardens to establish to the green infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think it's important to know that even if we don't enlarge the area, if we can uh, spread the influence of the park through these green corridors, it's important. And in terms of the cities, I'm no longer preoccupied with the sprawling of the building area. I'm really preoccupied with the planning of the land use in each neighborhood. What I think is important is that we are able to, in the future, to have small neighborhoods in each town which have all the, the, the needs for the people who live there. If we are able to make uh, micro planning and if you, we are able to allow people to have the place where to, to sleep and the, people, the, the place where to work and the place where to have health care and the place where to have study and, and so on. So these are small neighborhoods which are in the city. So the city is, we, we, we wish to have a city which work as a conurbation of small neighborhood areas, diminishing a lot the pendular migrations, because this is a big problem in the city. And if you ask what is nowadays main top problem in Lisbon, main top investment in the city probably is the mobility issue. Yeah. We are working a lot in terms of cycling paths, we are working a lot in terms of um, uh, improving the use of the public transportation and to benefit, to enrich, to, to improve the quality of the public transportation. So um, during decades, we had an improvement of the private transport and uh, it was fuel, uh, uh, fuel uh, spending, uh, money, energy, and uh, ecology. So I think we, we need to, to direct ourselves to the main issues in the city. And uh, I think it's no use to try to stop this problem of the cities. Okay. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we are already over time. However, I have two questions more. How do you feel about it? Should we make the questions? I, give, I leave it to you to decide. Yes? No? Okay, so let's try, Stella. Um, let's try now with Stella. Can you please um, speak? Yes, now you can. Hi, uh, hello. Hello, Stella. Can you listen to me, okay? Yes. yes, excuse me by the technical problem. Um, it's changing the, the, the topic we are talking before about the will being uh, in natural, in protecting natural area of urban parks. In the case of Cocherola, I we explained that in when you did the study, we asked people, visitors or, or users, uh, what is the the level of contribution they think about the the, the Cocherola Natural Park in relation with the physical activity they did use uh, during the week or in, during the weekend, and um, it's, it's not real uh, well-being in terms of health. But yes, in, in level of physical activity or no sedentary uh, free time. And we are uh, finding really interesting results about this connection. Uh, in, for example, in the distance people live from the park or the um, physical activity they did, in, for example, in the workplace. No? Um, when this is the, the benefits of of this kind of area on the level of physical activity of uh, the people in the city is really important. If you, the, the average was 80 from one to 10, no? 
And I think it's another point of view. Uh, it's necessary to study because we can connect some uh, part of the park that is more, um, I don't know what to say in English, is more uh, prepared to do this, uh, uh, for example, uh, some specific outdoor, for example, you know, hiking or biking or so on. Okay. But do you have any specific question you would like to address or was just to add up to the discussion? Was just no, no, we, we want to, in, including the, discuss, the discussion uh, we have before, when the, the study they did in the, I don't know, UK, from the uh, benefits of uh, this kind of area on the health. Okay. Okay, um, we will certainly do another webinar on health and maybe by then you, you, you can also share um, your, uh, your experience, Estella. The next webinar on health will be in October after our conference also so we can build upon the, the topics of our conference. Um, so maybe we'll leave a, a discussion open here um, and see how can Peri Urban Parks contribute to the health agenda later on in October. How do you feel about this? Okay, so the very last and really fast question, Ricardo, because we are too much over time. Uh, Ricardo, I give you the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, when I raised my hand, it was not a question, it was a comment on the discussion that was going on at that moment. Okay. That was related with the uh, crowding in these in this, uh, uh, peri-urban parks, which is a problem for the park, but we also need to uh, uh, understand that the benefits of the park for all those that live around cities uh, and uh, cannot live without this overcrowding. We have overcrowding cities, so obviously that the, our peri-urban parks will suffer for the same. I think that the, the, the real issue is to, uh, to teach these people how to behave in this park so that they can enjoy the other ones that we have that are more important, more related with proper nature conservation, which is being so, so much attacked by everything nowadays, and probably raising uh, the, the population and the users in these parts about the importance of these places could bring benefits for all the other ones, because uh, over tourism, overcrowding, over everything is happening nowadays, and it will not stop unless we uh, will be like one third of the total population in the world, which is not going to happen. So we need to uh, take care of that and manage that as uh, an issue that is a challenge for all managers, for all users, for all technicians and so on. So maybe ask people what do they like to do and maybe if you could provide them, they will behave properly instead of going off trail like it happened in Monsanto and in other places, for example. That's just a, a comment. Sorry, it's not a question, but then it's easy to finish it. Yes, thank you very much, Ricardo. Yes, indeed. Um, Speaking, Fernando, I'll give you 30 seconds because we really need to end. But I, I just want to say that indeed environmental education is really, really important. And there is a coming opportunity um, for raising awareness of people and on the importance of parks that I will tell you right after Fernando um, answers. Fernando. I just want to say two things. One thing is the overcrowding, the exceeding the carrying capacity of an infrastructure leads that the people don't take advantage of itself. So if you are going to a park to, pro to, to take profit of nature and you are overcrowded, you are not going to see nature. So this is a problem. But this is also something very useful for us, which is to tell the decision makers that we have the need of more areas like this. And this is very important to influence the, 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 those who are going to make the decisions in order to have more and more parks more and more infrastructures directed to people who wish to take advantage of nature. Thank you, Fernando. You keep up with the 30 seconds. Well done. Um, and yes, um, thank you for your inputs. And thank you to all of the participants um, that have joined us today. I hope you have enjoyed this new system of webinar. I find it much more interactive and personal. Um, but before you go, and following this thread that Ricardo opened up, the need to um, inspire people and to help them to shape behavior, I just want to share my screen once more to tell you about the European Day of Parks. 
which will be also our next um, webinar. So our next webinar will be on the 24th of May. And the 24th of May is a very special date, uh, date for all protected areas in Europe. We will be celebrating this year our natural treasures and every single protected area, um, marine protected area, peri-urban park, biosphere reserve, every protected area is invited to organize an event uh, and to register it on our website. So the idea is that on the 24th of May, before and after, so on those weekends before and after the 24th of May will be the main uh, core activities taking place, we invite you, all of you, to organize an event, to call your community and to show them the importance of your park. This is an overview of the map um, of some events that are taking place. Um, and it's very easy to find it on our website again. You go to Nature and People, and then it's the first one, European Day of Parks. And apart from all the materials that we produced in, I don't know, 30 languages for now, so the materials are available in many, many languages. You can use those promotional materials and then register um, your events here. So we can be displayed on um, the European Day of Parks map. So this is an open call to all of you. I hope on the 24th of May, all of you will be outdoors, um, engage with your communities. Uh, and I want to thank once more to Teresa, to Fernando and to Ricardo for having shared your expertise with us. Um, it was a really successful webinar and I hope you have all enjoyed. Thank you very much. Um, and see you on the 24th of May uh, on a webinar if you're not outdoors. Thank you and have a nice day.